Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Reynolds and in this first lecture I'm going to talk about why study intercultural communication. The topics for this talk come from chapter one of intercultural communication in context, but please be aware that this lecture is not a replacement for reading the book. The book has a lot of important information and I just want to highlight some of the main ideas here. I'm going to turn my camera off so you can see the full slides as we move forward, uh, but I hope you find this uh, useful. Please email me if you have any questions about anything I mentioned in this talk. So to get started, this chapter, right, about why, why it's important or why it's necessary to study intercultural communication, focuses on some big ideas that we'll be talking about throughout the, the session. So through intercultural relationships, one can learn a tremendous amount about other people and their cultures and about oneself and one's own cultural background, right? So one of the ideas about intercultural communication is that we're not just learning to communicate, but we're learning to understand and think about cultures in different ways that are productive and allow us to actually be better communicators and develop strategies to work with new cultures as we come into contact with them. Um, it's not always easy, right? So it's, there's many challenges. Intercultural communication can involve barriers like stereotyping. Stereotyping is this idea of using a small set of beliefs about someone to represent an entire population or entire culture, or using one or limited numbers of examples as kind of representative of an entire culture, right? So does one black person represent what all black people do? Does one Catholic represent who all Catholics are, right? Does one woman represent all women in the world? Well, of course not, right? But we can, sometimes when we have limited experience with other cultures and uh, use kind of limited ideas and understandings of those cultures or limited exposure to a few individuals to think about that as being representative of an entire culture. So we misunderstand by trying to oversimplify that culture through stereotyping. Another thing that we'll talk about a lot is discrimination. And discrimination is this idea that there are majority and minority cultures and that people can either be considered as insiders or outsiders of those cultures, right? So, uh, and what, what results from that is that people outside of those cultures can sometimes be um, removed or denied opportunities uh, that exist for members of the majority cultures. So these are things we're going to think about, some challenges to understanding other cultures and to working with other cultures. Um, the book identifies six imperatives or reasons for studying intercultural communication, but I'm going to discuss seven um, as we go through here. So number one, and I think um, something that can be both uh, the most challenging uh, and the easiest, uh, depending on who you are to explore, is the self-awareness imperative. That is, it is useful to study inter intercultural communication because it helps us understand ourselves and our position in the world around us, our understanding of our own culture um, and how that fits into the world. So, um, one of the challenges to understanding ourselves is that we can sometimes become blind to the influence of our own culture on our, on our own experience. We call this idea ethnocentrism, and that is the idea that we put our own cultures at the center of our understanding of the world. Um, to the extent that oftentimes, sometimes consciously, but oftentimes subconsciously, we believe our own culture is superior to other cultures. Now, I know some people are going, well, I don't think I'm superior to anybody. Uh, and, and you're right, that consciously most of us, many of us in a democratic society would not say, right, that my, my culture and my way is the right way or the best way. Uh, but oftentimes as a culture, we do have values, hold values and expectations that we believe to be kind of the right ones for our culture, right? So think about American culture as, majority American culture as defined largely through whiteness and middle class experience. And you can see this in the news when people 
dehumanize or blame people who are poor or people who are immigrants, right? And have expectations who say, well, if you work hard enough, right, you wouldn't be poor. And if you learned English, you would be accepted into our culture. These values of uh, a particular work, work ethic and the belief that working hard will actually help you be uh, successful in a particular society, that you can work beyond other barriers, right? Or this idea that uh, English is the uh, language that everybody should learn and use are ethnocentric, right? It doesn't mean that they're inherently bad, right? Finding ways to commonly, uh, to motivate people to work or to find uh, one language through which we can better communicate uh, aren't inherently bad ideas, right? But the idea that there is one particular kind of more valued way points to our ethnocentrism, right? And so one of our challenges in learning about ourselves and looking at the way other cultures function and the way they interpret us and understand us, um, or the way that we understand ourselves if we're parts of different minority groups in relationship to the majority group, is to kind of help us understand what we're blind to in our own self-awareness and how learning that information can make us more effective um, communicators and citizens of the world, right? Uh, this is important, increasingly important because we live in a world that is increasingly diverse. And we see this particularly in the United States, but it's happening everywhere. Uh, think in Europe, for example, the huge influx of uh, Syrian immigrants, or before that, the Kurds who moved out of Iraq uh, looking for safe places to be. Before that, Somalis, there, there have always been these kind of movements. But of course, the United States has been thought of as a melting pot for quite some time. And we see that in changing U.S. demographics. Because the United States, of course, originally did not have European people in it, right? Um, so those European people were the initial immigrants, right? This people who have become the majority culture were not the majority culture when they first arrived. It's important to kind of think about that just to give you a framework for how to think about how cultures evolve and change through changing demographics. Demographics are kind of how we characterize and categorize a population of people by things like race, ethnicity, age, sex, income, etc., etc. You'll notice and I think this is important to note that the fastest growth among minority cultures in America are multiracial Americans. That is increasingly in America, people are not part of one or only one uh, demographic category. And we'll talk later about intersectionality, but intersectionality is this idea that we are, our identities are more than just being one demographic category, right? But that these things all interplay, that the experience of an African-American woman is different than the experience of an African-American man, that the experience of, <coughs> sorry, um, a Catholic middle-class white American is different than the experience of a Southern Baptist uh, white American, right? So there are intersectionality, the ways in which these different elements interact. But just thinking about kind of racial and ethnic minorities, we can see how diverse the United States is and that we're moving towards a majority minority culture. That is a culture in which no single ethnic group would account for more than 50% of the population. So roughly 60% of the U.S. population in 2019 um, were still non-Hispanic whites. But that is a number that is increasingly uh, diminishing over time while we see growth among different groups and particularly around, among multiracial Americans. You'll note that there are now 109 cultures that are majority minority. That is where there is no one majority ethnic group and minority groups account for more than 50% of the population, right? Um, there is increasing diversity because of this in the US workforce. What does that mean? Well, that means we need to study intercultural communication because even in our own 
country, the United States, we will be working with an increasingly diverse population and we need to find ways to work effectively with them and overcome barriers and challenges to be successful. Part of the changing U.S. demographics is also changing immigration patterns, right? So I mentioned, of course, that the United States is often thought of as a nation of immigrants. That is that the people who originally lived here, some people, Native Americans, American Indians, uh, people of the First Nations, they, those people lived here before and were already a diverse group of people. That is, there are lots of different um, Native groups, right? When the all these early immigrants pre-1619 were, were European, Western European immigrants who then established what is now kind of the Eastern United States, right? In 1619, the first slave from Africa was brought to Jamestown. And from then we see then an influx, an influx of African immigrants um, who were non-voluntary, right? They didn't choose to come, but were forced to come to what is now the United States, okay? Um, so we're gonna talk really quickly about kind of how these changing immigration patterns affect diversity. We can think about these two ideas of heterogeneous and homogeneous. Um, heterogeneous are groups of cultures that are diverse and different. Homogeneous are cultures that are, are similar, right? Um, and so over time, cultures can become more or less homogenous, right? Um, diversity is this idea of what can be different, right? How many different ways in which we can be different if we look at a group of people within a community, right? Um, interestingly, a growing number of research studies show that being around people who are different can make one more creative, more diligent and make one work harder, especially for groups that, in, that value innovation and new ideas, which certainly is true of kind of standard values for America, right? Um, so there are values to embracing diversity and to avoid becoming overly homogenous, right? Um, so we have seen shifts from uh, Western Europeans and what results in an Anglo-centrism, that is making kind of European, particularly British, culture at the center of the understanding of what it means to be American, right? Uh, to the then entrance of people from uh, Southern, Central, and Eastern Europe, for example, Italy and Poland, they say, um, which comes to this idea of the melting pot, where all these people, though originally perceived as significantly different culturally, were eventually integrated or assimilated into society, so they were all counted as white, um, you'll see in the 19th and 20th centuries, and I would say probably again now, there are nativistic or anti-immigrant movements, right, uh, that encourage violence against newer immigrants. In particular, in 1880s, you see the Chinese Exclusion Act that has to do with uh, the large number of Chinese immigrants brought in to build the railroad from the West Coast. Uh, in 1924, Oriental Exclusion Act. And so by the 1930s, there, become, there is kind of a fixed idea that everybody who, who becomes white, who appears to be of light skin, is assimilatable, um, while other people then can be easily identified by their skin color as um, excluded and non-assimilatable from majority culture. Economic conditions oftentimes force changes in immigration. There's a reason why people um, come and go to different countries because there are available economic opportunities. Uh, during the Depression, for example, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans were oftentimes forced to, to return to Mexico to free up jobs for white Americans. But when post-World War II prosperity returned, Me Mexicans were welcomed back as a source of cheap labor. And that is a practice that continues through uh, things like migrant labor programs that offer 
temporary visas to people from Mexico and Central America to come to the United States, work a series of agricultural jobs, and then return uh, to Mexico and then do it all over again the next year, right? Um, there's an idea then sometimes that these immigrants are taking the jobs of Americans, right? And so there are um, movements, for example, in 2020 in Texas, to make it illegal for refugees to settle, right? Because this idea that they would be taking jobs. Even at the same time, we're intentionally bringing in groups of people to, um, to work jobs that traditional Americans uh, or established Americans of different cultures uh, choose not to do, right? Um, also because the United States is experiencing a time of very low unemployment. That is, there's not a large pool of workers um, to take those jobs. So one interesting thing in this last bullet I want to point out is most Americans are reluctant to admit that a class structure exists, even more reluctant to admit how difficult it is to move up in this structure. However, most people live their lives in the same economic class into which they were born. And there are distinct class differences in clothing, housing, recreation, conversation, and other aspects of, of daily life, right? Um, so the myth of cla classless society is hardly benign, right? It's not something that doesn't harm us. It can be very harmful to think like in America, anybody can become kind of the next billionaire. Uh, but there, those numbers are so small that that's actually, it's a myth, right? It's, it's something that's created to give a false hope among the working class and poor that they can get ahead. Um, and so how does that aspect of their culture kind of define how they see the world and how they interact with others? Well, that's something we'll talk about, right? Because that's an aspect of culture that we'll talk about. A lot of intercultural work is not just between people of different ethnicities or races, but also people of different classes, people of different first languages, people of different religions. And to think about culture as a broader idea than just race or ethnicity is important. Um, so just to think about class, for example, the top 20% of US households own more than 84% of the wealth and the bottom 40% combined for a mere 0.3%, right? And in fact, that, that number is going to just continue to increase because 95% of recent gains have gone to the richest 1% of people. <coughs> Sorry. The difference between CEO pay and unskilled workers is 354 to 1, right? So <clears throat> how, did that, how is that experience significantly different between the top 1% or the top 20% and the bottom 40%? And what about those people then in the middle, right? That 20, that 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 40% of middle class America. Like how how is how are they defined? How do they define themselves? And what values do we assign to them? Immigration also contributes to religious diversity, right? So we have Muslims, Buddhists, Confucians, Catholics, and many others that came to the United States after the initial kind of Protestant countries came. Um, increasingly diverse ethnic, racial, economic, political, and religious groups come into contact mostly during the day in schools, businesses, and other settings, bringing different languages, histories, and economic statuses. In other words, it's important we study because the demographics have changed and we interact regularly, right? The main challenge is to look beyond the stereotypes and biases, to recognize the disparities and differences, and to try to apply what one knows about intercultural communication. Diversity can be a positive force. Dem demographic diversity in the United States has given people tremendous linguistic richness and culinary variety. I like the culinary variety, right? Think about uh, in the United States, how many options we have for different kinds of food from different places in the world, right? Varied resources to meet new social challenges as well as domestic and international business opportunities. And this is one of the reasons economically that's really driving intercultural communication is that there are increasingly United States-based com companies that are international, right? Multinational, transnational. And that leads us to our third reason, the economic imperative. The idea of globalization, that is that we live in a world market, means that business people have to work with people across the world from very different cultures, right? So one of the ways that intercultural communication started was through business communication and this need to effectively work 
with people who were from very different countries, right? And that's, I think, a more obvious reason for why people started studying intercultural communication uh, and still is an important reason to study now because some of you will go on to be technical writers or to work internationally and gaining these still skills will help you economically and will help the companies you work for economically. Uh, the environmental imperative is an interesting uh, newer idea about how we think about the importance of intercultural communication. And is that is that our environment is constantly changing and that changing environment is leading to an increased number of what we call climate refugees. That is people who are driven from their, uh, their home places and must go somewhere else. And that brings into contact of course, more people from different cultures. In Louisiana, it's very easy to see this effect uh, post Hurricane Katrina. During Hurricane Katrina, when much of New Orleans was devastated by not only the hurricane, but the, the ensuing floods from the breaking of the levees, we saw a max, mass exodus from New Orleans to all over the United States, but particularly to the Houston area and to northern Louisiana. And what we realized was that the people who came from New Orleans had a particular culture and particular expectations and understandings and values with those cultures, and that those cultures um, conflicted sometimes with people in Houston, which had a very different culture, and people in northern Louisiana that had very different cultures, right? So being aware of how things like wildfires and droughts and hurricanes and monsoons and flooding that seem to be much uh, more common in today's world can lead to the need for our ability to work effectively across international borders and cultural differences um, so that we can help people who need help right during environmental um, events. The technological imperative uh, is two part. First, technology and human communication. We now live in a global village where we can reach out and connect to people across the world. This allows us to experience and, and meet people from across the world in diff different people with different cultures who are very different from ourselves. Also people who are similar to ourselves to build communities of support. Um, and then actually not only kind of be aware of them, like we might've been through TV or movies, but also then communicate with them because the, uh, ubiquity of cell phones and internet that allows people to have access to reach each other. Right. Um, a couple of things to, to recognize in bold there, identity management, right? So we have a sense of identity, who we think we are, how we self-identify. Identity management is this idea that we can kind of control that, right? That we manage who we are, right? Um, and that when we move in different, different ways around the world, that part of our reason for thinking about identity is to kind of maintain who we think we are authentically, right? Um, so think about diasporic groups, that is, uh, ethnic or national groups that are dispersed throughout the world. I think the easiest for American culture is to think about African Americans and how um, there are black people from Africa uh, who are still in Africa, black people from Africa who were brought to, of course, the United States, uh, who were then had very different experiences at very different times and spread out across the United States, but also who we, who were brought as slaves to uh, the Caribbean and to South America. So that what has become kind of African identities has been lost in a lot of ways through different experiences. But we can study now in history how different groups of people have preserved or managed identities, right, to keep connections to particular aspects of African culture that we can still trace today, right? Um, 
newer groups who are dispersed throughout the world might have a tighter connection to their identity. So think about if you um, eat at a an ethnic restaurant and the people that own that at restaurant still speak that language um, and maybe decorate or have music from that culture, right? Um, shows us how identity management kind of works for diasporic groups, that is groups that spread out, right? Um, oftentimes, sometimes by choice, right? Because they come for economic opportunity, but oftentimes, for example, in the case of slavery, non-voluntarily, right? That they are forced to move. And sometimes through these other events, right? Uh, like environmental impact events. The other access, uh, the other in, in technological impar imperative is that we increasingly have more access to communication. But it is important to note that there is still an equity of technology between the haves and have nots. So oftentimes, I've seen this certainly with my students uh, who grew up in the age of American internet where um, everybody could, seems to have access to a smartphone and internet. Uh, this is not necessarily the case. That is, there are still people who are excluded from digital society. Uh, and being aware of that will help us understand their experiences. So it allows, these technologies allow us to more easily gain cultural capital or awareness of kind of cultural knowledge and cultural comp competencies, what is expected of us and what we should or should not be able to do. But um, not everybody has the same access. So it's important to note that. Uh, another important issue we'll talk about towards the end of the semester in particular is the peace imperative. And that is, how can we figure out ways to effectively communicate and work with people of other cultures to get beyond conflict, right? Um, we'll talk about ideas of colonialism and post-colonialism later in the semester, but it is important important or useful to recognize that when we come into other contact with other cultures, that there is this ethnocentric idea that because our culture and our values are superior, at least subconsciously in, within us, that we want to impose those on others. And this is um, kind of the result of colonialism. When colonialism is is coming into a country or coming into a group and <clears throat> imposing majority culture on this group in, through contact, right? Um, and so in contemporary terms, in American cultural values, we have we now kind of view colonialism as a neg largely as a negative thing, right? Um, and that is that part of democracy recognizes the value of difference and the value of different voices, right? But we're still dealing with the echoes of our own colonial past, right? Uh, and the colonial past of Western Europe and its impact on the world around us, right? So um, part of what we're going to talk about is like one of the reasons we're really working on intercultural communication is to make the world a better and safer and more peaceful place, right? Um, and finally, ethical, right? Ethical, um, obviously this could be tied to peace, uh, but ethics is, is more than that. It's kind of like deciding what is good and bad behavior, what's right and wrong. Um, some judgments, of course, are explicit, right? But many others are those kind of cultural experiences, that ethnocentricity that we, we host within ourselves um, to think about what's right or wrong and can are there ways we can think about what's right or wrong if we come from cultures where right or wrong are defined in perhaps very different ways for certain issues right um and so the two big ideas you think about when we think about ethics are are ethics all relative that means specific to just one culture or are they universal that is there are kind of some underlying things that all things are good and all things are bad right um I like the book gives a good example of how the Ten Commandments, some people think the Ten Commandments are a universal code of behavior, like every, these are things that everybody should do. But even Christian groups often disagree about the universality of the Bible and how those expectations um, come to play in daily life, right? So 
Um, what the book then suggests and what we'll explore this semester is instead of adopting this idea where it's all relative, that it's all really just specific, each culture is completely different, we're all universal at the end of the day, we're all the same, is that um, we need to kind of find that middle ground. And finding that middle ground means adopting different, um, different approaches to culture as well. And so um, the ethical imperative is driving the book's use of the dialogical. Dialogical means in dialogue, right? So a mixture of different voices. Um, and emphasizing relationships and dialogues between individuals and communities and, and wrestling with ethical dilemmas. So <clears throat> by the end of this semester, hopefully by looking at these things, we should be able to judge what is ethical and unethical behavior given variations in cultural priorities and identify guidelines for ethical behavior in an intercultural context in which ethics clash, right? So we have to recognize that, sure, there are some things that universally everybody seems to believe is right or wrong, right? But there are differences because different cultures prioritize different ideas and different values. Uh, but that we still have to figure out ways to work together. So we should be able to kind of figure out how to communicate in different contexts. Um, so ultimately what we want to do in becoming, uh, in studying intercultural communication is becoming more ethical students of culture, right? So uh, the three issues we're going to talk about, self-reflexivity, learning about yourself, learning about others, and social justice. That is learning what how we can use what we know to improve uh, the social standing and acceptance of all the different peoples from the different cultures with whom we interact. Um, one of the ideas that drives this is cultural humi humility, um, which is having an awareness of the limitations of one's own cultural background and worldview, as well as the limitations of an ability to truly understand the cultural background and experience of, as, of others. In other words, are, we have to recognize that we are defined and limited by our own experiences and our own background and our own value system. And also that as much as we try to understand others, we never fully understand them, right? So we have to continue to try to learn, right? And number two, trying to take an other-oriented stance in each intercultural encounter, which includes trying to suppress any ready-made cultural assumptions about the other. What are ready-made cultural assumptions? Well, those are stereotypes, right? Things we believe without any kind of critical thought about others. So taking an other-oriented stance is simply putting yourselves in the other person's shoe. In other words, how, would, how might we think about ourselves as the other to improve that experience of intercultural communication? Uh, so social justice is kind of, it says the final eth ethical issue, um, is the process of communicating, inspiring, advocating, organizing, and working with others of similar and diverse organizational affiliations to help all people gain respect and participate fully in society in a way that benefits the community as well as the individual. So communication is central, which is why we're studying it. The outcome of social justice should be beneficial for society and the individuals, not just the individuals involved. In other words, we're not trying to help individuals, we're trying to help individuals to build a better society. Uh, and of course, respect for and participation by all. That is being inclusive rather than exclusive. So why study intercultural communication? Well, because we can learn, we, we can and should learn more about ourselves and our own experiences. There is an increasingly diverse demographic that is within our own in our within our own country and within the world itself. That is, people are increasingly diverse, and we are interacting more and more with people who are not like us. Economically, uh, it is necessary to be able to work on a world scale and interact with people of different cultures to make the money. Uh, environmentally, we have to recognize that there are in, environmental factors that drive the changing demographics around us and make it necessary for us to respond to different parts of the world to help people uh, of different cultures. The technological imperative, uh, primarily the internet, which drives connectivity across the world and allows us to mo have more contact with people from diverse and different cultures. Um, the peace imperative, right? Ultimately, what can we what should we be striving for? We should be striving for a more peaceful, less conflicted human experience, right? Uh, 
Um, and then the ethical imperative, how are we actually going to study it? Um, well, we're going to study it with kind of an, an ethical, a, a right or wrong perspective where we value diversity. And we put that kind of in the front of everything we do, that we value others um, and that we are working towards a better society for everyone.